Jesus' ministry was ministering to the masses through miracle signs and wonders. But at the same time, He would multiply Himself in the people, small group of people, and that's what we called discipleship. If we, go, we look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 and 37, it says, Then Jesus went about to all the cities. And I want you to notice what He was doing is He was teaching. He was preaching. And then He was healing every disease and every sickness among the people. Masses did not come to Jesus because Jesus was handing out free hot dogs. Masses came to Jesus not because He was a great speaker. Masses came to Jesus because Jesus was healing all disease. Till Jesus never had a problem attracting masses. And I believe that the church of Jesus Christ, if we stop relying on Facebook ads and bulletin boards and start relying more on signs and wonders and miracles, we will reach masses for Jesus as well. This building, not only it will be too small, Toyota Center will be small. Because God's method to reach the world is miracle signs and wonders. It's not only a method of God, it's a representation of His goodness and love for people. God doesn't use miracles like like Facebook ads to reach people. He uses miracles to love on people, to care for people, and to give the devil a black eye to destroy the works of darkness. Because sickness is the work of sin. Because demonization is the work of demons. And God wants to give the devil a black eye through signs and wonders. Amen. But it doesn't end there. The Bible says after he went out, the scripture says in here is that he saw the multitudes. These are the multitudes that He healed and He ministered to. And the Bible says He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and they were scattered. They were like sheep and they had no pastors. And He said to His disciples, the harvest, meaning people are ready, but the leaders, people who will go and heal the sick, people who will go and cast out demons, people who will go and cleanse the lepers, people who will go and raise the dead, people who will not just go and make coffee, direct traffic and babysit children on Sunday school, though that's important. But the real ministry of Jesus is not organizing a Sunday morning service. It's populating heaven, it's plundering hell, and it's doing the work that Jesus did, reaching masses. Amen. If we have miracles, we will have a crowd. But if we have disciples, we will have a future. Jesus did not only reach multitudes. Jesus also made disciples. And because of that, Jesus Christ, when He died, His ministry, His agenda took off. When I would meet with our pastoral team and I said, let's be honest. If we all as a pastoral team die today, will our church explode tomorrow or will it disappear in six months? And I can tell you one thing, it will not explode. Partially is because we are better at gathering crowds than building an army. And I do believe the Lord wants to have us both. He wants us to have the supernatural miracles, but He also wants us to have a strategic focus on multiplying ourselves and other people for the future. So that we're not just having a revival here and now, but we're planting seeds into the revival for the next generation and the next generation. Our God is the God of Abraham, but He's also the God of Isaac. He's also the God of Jacob. And He's also the God of Joseph. And He's also the God of Moses. And He's also the God of David. And He's also the God of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's also a God of this generational. Our culture has an obsession with children. Today, the demonic agenda of indoctrination is focused specifically. People are giving money today to mutilate children, confuse children, indoctrinate children. Why? Because they know they don't have the adult population. Let's confuse the young generation. And as the church, what discipleship does is it multiplies the character of Jesus in the hearts of younger next generation, thus spreading the agenda of the kingdom of God, not only in our generation, but a generation yet to come. Amen. You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. I believe that when the church loses the supernatural, 
we are in the mist we are mistaken without the supernatural without miracles we are mistaken the church took two extremes first extreme is cessationist God has ended all the miracles God stopped doing miracles the Bible is written we don't need miracles anymore well people are still sick people are still demonized and and God is still powerful God God is not Christian God is the Almighty God and for God to do miracles is the same thing as for me to breathe that's who he is and cessation is pretty much said we don't need miracles we don't we just need to preach the word preach the word we don't need the supernatural and Jesus says you don't know the scriptures so we need the scriptures but he says you don't know the power of God and therefore you're mistaken now the charismaniacs went to the other side and made it into a sensation where everything is about more miracles and just experiencing God and it's literally where we made experiencing the power of God as the only reason for existence and living we made it a goal instead of a means to a goal and of course a lot of the cessationist people who are reformed will look at a lot of the charismatics and say well you, all you're doing is pretty much you're only about miracles you're only about miracles but it doesn't have a purpose there is no mission to that and there's a healthy balance where we have the supernatural but we also have the Jesus' strategy to use that supernatural to communicate the love of God for the purpose of the salvation of people for the purpose of making disciples are you with me and so we need both I want you to notice in Exodus chapter 1 verse 10 it says let us deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply it happened and it happened that in in, in a went in an event of war that they will join with our enemies and fight against us and go up in the land the devil will fight every church so that the church does not have supernatural. So that we only have things that we can explain. But the moment we get the supernatural and we're not afraid of the moving of the Holy Spirit, he will then fight the church, make sure the church doesn't multiply. Why? Because yeah, you got the miracles and signs and wonders, but it will die with you. The next generation is not going to extend and move in that because you did not make disciples, you didn't multiply. Pharaoh was afraid of multiplication because multiplication means there will be a war and you will win. Multiplication leads to multitudes and multitudes means might. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion. Something happens when the church begins to multiply. We become a force to be reckoned with. Not because we're trying to overthrow political things. No, 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 no. It's because through a grassroots movement, people are becoming disciples. And like they said of disciples of Jesus, they fill Jerusalem with this teaching. We begin to infiltrate society like salt. We begin to infiltrate society like light. And we begin to shift and change things in our society and in our community and the devil is afraid of that and so if he will let us if he can't stop us from receiving the supernatural and filling us with traditional teaching that we don't need miracles we don't need signs and wonders we shouldn't have deliverances then he will make sure that we stop and we don't see multiplication and we don't see discipleship being done the problem with this guys is that the devil will throw everything at you and me so that you don't multiply so that he can steal the future you say okay you got the present you're gonna fill the Toyota Center you're gonna do race to deliver conferences you're, you're going to move forward the kingdom of God people will be delivered but I also know that I have the future because your children are not in church your children are not being discipled because you don't have a plan for the future your only plan for the future is just to have more services instead of having more disciples as long as I can keep you in preservation, so you protect your comfort, you protect your schedule, you keep your own life, I will prevent future Moses from being born. This week as I was praying, this week and last week, I felt this burden from the Lord for our church and for the future. It's almost like if the devil cannot stop people being born again, as long as they don't get discipled, as long as they don't get connected to a small group, as long as they don't get connected to other disciples and to other leaders and they don't grow up to be disciple makers. He told, Pharaoh told the Israelites, he says that if you have babies, I'm okay with that. As long as they end up in the Nile. Yeah, you can have a lot of people get saved here. I'm okay with that. As long as nobody disciples them. Because if you have a big crowd, I know one thing is once you all die, I have the future. Because whoever has disciples, 
those are the people that have the future. Whoever has our children, those are the people that have the future. And that's why what I'm talking about today is not just about us. Oh, make sure as a church we do discipleship. What I'm talking about is the teenagers that are in schools right now. The clubs that are being opened. The young kids that we have right now. That these, this vision is for our children, our great children, and other children. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Because we want to spread the message of our King through our family, through our spiritual family, and fill as many people with the teaching of Jesus as we possibly can. That's our church. Big chest, chicken legs. What does that mean? This is deliverance. This is evangelism and discipleship. Now, those legs are there, don't get me wrong, they're just skinny. And the reason why you don't see the skinny legs is because we wear pants. What I mean by that is this, because there is a feel at Hungry Gen of incredible worship, there's a feel of incredible conferences that we have. We have some really good looking pastors like Pastor Vlad. We have really amazing pastors in our church that travel. They're, they're powerful. They're dynamic. They're incredible. We have services that are filled. We have small groups that are, you know, starting in schools. Our youth ministry is doing really good. Our team is releasing another album. There's a lot of great things that are happening. People are being delivered left and right. And there is a big chest, almost no neck, so big. But if we be very honest, the legs are chicken legs. Let's, let, let, let's talk for real right now. Our church probably tripled during COVID. But it didn't triple because you and I evangelized. It tripled because other churches were closed down. Can, can we be honest? Yeah. Our church is growing. People are moving here. But they're not moving here because you're strategically or I am strategically evangelizing. It's because the YouTube, Instagram and TikTok is evangelizing. The Bible doesn't say make YouTube videos and grow the church. The Bible says go and make disciples. So to some degree we cover that, if we just be very honest, we cover that with pens and we just simply say well we're doing great and because we do see the supernatural, people do come here and they're like we want to learn, we want to see what God is doing at Hungry Gen and there's definitely a big chest. I, I, I even think we got a six pack as well. And uh, we got some pretty amazing prayer movement, a fasting movement. We got a young church, a vibrant church. I mean, I personally for me, this is the best place to be. I've been to many churches. I love Hungry Gen. I love the crazy Hungry Gen. I love the good stuff of Hungry Gen, the bad stuff. Everything I love about Hungry Gen. But I'll be honest with you, when we take our pants down, when we have an honest look at our church, everyday believer mainly comes to Sunday morning, pays their tithe, volunteers once a month, does not delete the planning center from their phone, praise God, and, and maybe once in a while goes to a life group. For example, out of about 600 people or 500 people every Sunday, only 100 people go to a small group. Why? Why is that happening? Because we got chicken legs. This is not your problem. I'm saying this is our problem. But because we got a big chest, we feel good about our church. We're like, man, we got the best church. We can't go very far with chicken legs. And I believe the time is coming. What I'm, my goal today is I'm going to bring you a treadmill. I'm not going to ask you to run on this treadmill yet. I'm just going to let you know that very soon there is going to be a very intentional approach to us getting a little bit more of muscle on our legs. Come on somebody. Discipleship without deliverance ends in defeat. So we've experienced that. We see this with Lazarus is that he who had died came out bound. And we see that he was bound in his hands. He was bound in his feet. He was also had his face covered. He was wrapped up. And I think that those of you who came from churches that deliverance was not done. I think you've, you've seen now here how deliverance is so powerful. A young man that came up today right before the service and um, he had a spirit that was attacking him and he would kill animals. And not like animals, hunting animals, but he would take a pet, bring it to his house and kill him. And that's not normal. That's demonic. 
And so and now that he was delivered and his testimony is, I have a pet and I haven't killed. Definitely, he probably won't share that on the stage, but I shared it on his behalf. You know, and for some of you, that may seem bizarre because you can't disciple somebody if they were not delivered. You got to deliver them. Jesus says to Lazarus about Lazarus whom he raised from the dead. He says that, loose him and let him go. So people who are born again need to be loosed. They need to be delivered so that then they can actually walk for the glory of God. We've experienced that. Deliverance is children's bread. Can somebody say amen? But it's not everything. Deliverance without discipleship leads to disobedience. I remember one, one time where in the Bible it says Jesus delivered a guy who wanted to be a disciple. You know the first sign that you know you're truly delivered is actually if you want to be discipled by Jesus. If you're delivered and you're like, I don't want to read the Word. I don't want to participate in a small group. I don't want none of that. I want to keep my own life. I would really question the, the genuineness of your deliverance. The guy who had legion of demons said, Jesus, I want to go with you. And Jesus says, honestly, bro, I'm going to skip the discipleship part. I'm going to launch you into the ministry right away. Go and tell everybody. But for most of us, we have to go from deliverance to discipleship so that then we can go into the destiny God has for us. Matthew chapter 21 verse 10, it says, go into the village opposite of you. He says, you will find, you will find the donkey tied. And he says, loose them. So this speaks that we bring somebody to Christ, we loose them. Somebody say, loose them. And then it says, bring them to me. This is discipleship. It's not just about letting people be free, and do what they want. Jesus says, bring them to me. You're delivered for a purpose. You're delivered so you can be discipled. And maybe you came to Jesus for deliverance for him to get the demons out. Jesus had a greater plan for you than just being delivered. If you lose this donkey and let it go to do whatever it wants, hunters like Bryson will shoot it. Bryson went hunting with, uh, with Rickard last week. They killed something. Yeah. If you get delivered and you don't get discipled, you can get shot. So God wants us to get delivered and so we can get discipled. But the purpose for even this discipleship is more. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 21 verse 10, watch this. When he had come into Jerusalem, guess who gave him a ride? This donkey that was loosed, brought to him. When he had come into Jerusalem, all the city, somebody say all the city. This is not just few people. All the city was moved. See, that's the ultimate goal of discipleship. Is that you get discipled. You get delivered. We get discipled. And then we give our life to Jesus. We get trained. We get brought to Jesus so that we can influence our city, our neighborhood, our friends and other people by doing what Jesus did. Heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead cleanse the lepers and preach the good news. That is our destiny. Amen. You can't get truly discipled if you're not delivered. But you can get delivered and never get discipled. You can manifest and get free from your demons only to go and do your own thing and say, you know what? Thank you, Jesus. Now I got it from here. That's not the purpose of deliverance. And I sense in my spirit that our church has developed such a strong deliverance culture that people go from deliverance to deliverance instead of from deliverance to discipleship. I'm not saying this applies to every person. I'm not saying it applies to you. It probably applies to the first service and the third service. This service has no problem like that. We're just talking about them right now and your neighbor, of course, but we're not talking about you. Maybe perhaps we're talking about you and myself. Deliverance is what God does for you. Discipleship is what God does in you. Deliverance removes the demons. Discipleship establishes Jesus' character. And it is easier to remove the demon. The reason why is because demon is tormenting, harassing you. It's kind of like this. Deliverance removes the tumor. Discipleship builds the muscles. And a lot of us, when we have, let's say, a person, if unfortunately the person would have a tumor, I mean, you would do anything it takes to get a tumor out. You would pay any doctor, you would go anywhere because you'd be like, I, I don't want this thing, this is hurting me. So when you get the tumor out, 
A lot of us wouldn't go and start eating healthy and exercising. We'd be like, well, I got it now. Now I can do whatever I want. And see, discipleship is building the muscles. But deliverance is getting rid of the tumor. Is getting rid of this cancer, getting rid of this demonic entity. And so what Jesus is after is not only getting rid of something, but actually building something within us. So I want you to embrace the kingdom mentality right now. My goal through this message is not to just preach another sermon, but to stir you toward Jesus's mentality and Jesus's culture that He wants to build within us. Deliverance without discipleship is like getting out of Egypt and never entering the promised land, but getting stuck in the wilderness. So there's deliverance, there's discipleship, and ultimately the goal is to reach the destiny, the promised land. The destiny, what is the destiny? It's the fivefold ministry of Jesus. Preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead. That is the fivefold ministry of Jesus. Jesus says anybody can do that. Why? Because He is divine. We're the branches. We're the extension of Jesus. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. Meaning you and I were expected. You were created for more than just coming on Sunday morning. You were created for more. The Bible says we were saved for good works. And those good works are not just parking cars. Those good works are not just guiding traffic in the church. Those good works are heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and preach the gospel. You were created for that. You were anointed for that. If God would only want you to go to heaven when you get saved, He would have killed you at the altar. You're still alive. That means you have a ministry, you have a calling, and you have a purpose. Somebody say, I have a destiny. Now, in the conclusion, I want you to remember five things. Five things. Number one is that loving God means obeying His commandments. Jesus clearly stated to us, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Now, I'm married to a beautiful girl, Lana, and loving my wife, for me, I know what that means. Um, a lot of things, but one of them is I have to remind her that I love her. Sometimes she would say things like, you haven't told me that you love me. And I was like, well, but I love you. She's like, well, you have to say that. And see, when I think of that, I'm thinking about God. It's interesting, God never said in the scripture, always tell me that you love me. God doesn't mind if you don't wake up in the morning and don't say, God, I love you. In fact, He doesn't want you to tell Him that you love Him. We don't see a lot of focus on that. The Bible says, if you love me, He doesn't say, tell me that you love me. If you love me, keep my commandments. In fact, God would rather have you not say that you love God and do His commandments than always say that you love God and don't do what He says. God's love is not this mushy emotion that you feel toward God. It's that your life is given toward Him. You have so much adoration and value for the Lord that you're saying, Lord, I will do your commandments. But I thought we were delivered from the law. Yes, but we were not delivered to be lawless. We have God's commandments. Jesus' commandment was very simple. He says before He died and he went to, before He went to heaven after His death, He says, go. Somebody say, go. Go, it has two words, G and O. Go, two, two, two letters. One word, two letters, go. And then He says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe. And then He says, lo, I am with you always. We love to claim the low without obeying the go. Jesus is with me. This I know. He is. But I, based on this verse, I will step on the limb to say, you will not experience His presence in the way He wants you to experience Him until the go comes before the low. So let's stop claiming the low if we don't want to obey the go. Loving God does not mean I don't kill anybody, I don't uh, cheat on my wife. Loving God doesn't just mean I just sing to Him every song. Jesus made it very clear how He wants to be loved. He wants us to obey His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. He gives us a very clear instruction and He says, when I go, you go. As you go into your world, make disciples. And then he says, I give you a promise. You're not going to do it alone. I'm going to be with you. My presence will be with you always until the end of age. And a lot of us, we would like to extract this and say, hello, he is with me. And of course, I'm not doing anything that he says, but he is with me. And I wonder, why am I not feeling His presence? I wonder, why it doesn't seem like anything is happening? Maybe we should just perhaps, what if we were maybe to try to obey what He says? 
We might experience him to be faithful and true. Making disciples is not a great suggestion. Jesus didn't say if you have time and you have nothing else to do, if you're one of those fanatics, do it. He says it's a great command. Jesus is a king. He's not an American president. Jesus is not your buddy. So he doesn't ask you. He doesn't use word please. He just commands. Now for some of you in American culture, the culture we live in, and I've lived here long, longer than in Ukraine, that is offensive because we're uh, in democracy. We rebelled against the kingdom. So when a king comes, we're like, we don't want a king. We want the president that we vote in and vote out and we can talk all that we want about him. But Jesus is not a president. He's a king and he is our king and he tells us to go. Amen. The second thing I want you to remember from today is loving people means having compassion on their souls. Because the second commandment is not just love God, but love people. All of this, it's not about converting. It's not about pushing your religion on other people. Jesus made it very clear. He expects us to love God and other people. Now, if you've been married for any long time or you have children, you understand one thing. In order to love somebody, you have to deny yourself, right? You can't love anybody without denying yourself. So the message of self-denial, the message of carrying the cross is not so you can become a martyr. It's so you and I can become a lover. The goal is love. The goal is not, oh, I'm denying this for Jesus. I'm just suffering, carrying my cross. No, the message is love. And Paul says, if you go and heal the sick, move mountains and do great things, but you don't love, he says, you're worthless. That means that the ultimate goal is not trying to get more people to church. The ultimate goal is to love people by having compassion on their souls. It's not trying to convert people. We're not hating on people. We are loving on people by caring for their souls. Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. One of the best ways that you can love people is to bring them the gift of salvation. So this is, this is what happened in Armenia. Um, the city that we went to, me and Ilya went there uh, last year or two years ago, last year. We went there and uh, there was this guy, he was a world-renowned swimmer. His name is Shavarj Karapetyan and he won a lot of awards during the Soviet Union era. Him and his brother was running and they noticed a bus that slid from the bridge and had over 90 people in it. And so when he noticed that, he was a professional swimmer who won awards, which means that he could swim. And instead of saying, well, I'm kind of busy right now. I'm, it's part of my run. I didn't plan for this. It's not on my calendar. And instead of tweeting, uh, my thoughts and prayers go with you, those on the bottom of the lake. Instead of stretching his hands and say, Lord, we agree to release angels into that place. He said to his brother, you stay here. He jumps into the lake. He begins to swim down it was dirty water full of glass and he begins to rescue people from the bottom of this lake one by one he rescued over 20 people because his lungs got filled with so much glass and dirt and everything he collapsed after 20th person he in fact during one of his dives grabbed a chair instead of a person and he says that chair still haunts him in his nightmare still this day because he says I could have saved the person he went into a coma for 40 days after this incident. He was never able to compete again in his life. Nobody knew about this for two years because communism, you know, suppressed the news everywhere and stuff. So nobody knew about this. And then this guy, we actually saw this lake. We drove by this lake. So me and Ilya saw this lake. This was the bridge. Of course, the river doesn't look like it was looking before. And so this is where it happened. Now, I want you to notice this. What would be the loving thing to do if you're a professional swimmer and people are drowning in front of you? Pray for them? Send thoughts and prayers? Screenshot and do a GoFund account for their families? The loving thing would be to, to do something about it. You don't have to be a professional swimmer to go do something about it. But what if it's not in your calendar? What if you have a date with somebody? What if you have an appointment with somebody? Well, it takes precedence. People take precedence over other things because people are priority. Jesus made it very clear for his disciples. He says, your number one priority is God. How do you love God? Obey his commandments. And then he says, your number two priority, it's not you, it's people. That means that if your neighbor does not know the Lord, it's not about just, oh, I'm going to pray for my neighbor. Well, Jesus says, go and open your mouth and talk to your neighbor. 
Well, my co-workers don't know God. Well, do they know that you're a Christian? Oh no, I don't want to tell them about Jesus. Why? I don't want to show my religion. I'm just going to pray for them. You don't pray for people who are drowning. You dive in and you save them. This guy, Shabash Karapetyan, years later goes to Moscow. He's walking by. He sees a building burning. And you would think he would be like calling, you know, the 911. He goes into the building, gets himself burned, rescues people and then has another problem with his lungs now because of the burning. He's literally like a savior, meaning he sees danger and he throws himself in danger to save other people. I'm not saying to go and throw yourself into danger. What I'm just saying is that the most loving thing to do is to save people, not just to send thoughts and prayers for them. And we as Christians, we over spiritualize our call and made it, well, we're just going to pray for them. God never tells us to pray for the lost people. He tells us to pray so that we will stop praying for them and actually go do something about it. Jesus tells us to pray for the laborers, not for the lost people. They're ready. But we just have to do the loving part and which is to tell other people about Jesus. Amen. Number three, winning souls and making disciples is part of spiritual growth. Now, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have to come to need milk and not solid food. Now the natural process that every person goes through in this room, and I hope that every person goes through in this room, is that you get born. Now we as Christians, we believe that um, we, our uh, life begins at conception. And not at birth, but at conception. Meaning um, when a... Uh, pregnant woman is murdered, it's a double homicide because there's another life that's inside. And uh, life doesn't begin when you are born, it begins in conception. There's so many stories of people being born premature and still alive and kicking and, and today are full-blown citizens. And so life begins at conception. Now what happens in the hospital is you get delivered. Mama delivers you. Right? Blood, screaming, yelling, kind of reminds me of our prayer line, right? <laughs> deliverance. So that's why it's called delivery room. When the baby that's alive there is being delivered. Now what happens when the baby is delivered, the baby comes into new world and then the baby is taken home. The only babies that stay in the hospital after being born in a hospital are either sick babies or abandoned babies. That's why we need small groups, we need home groups because everybody who gets delivered and gets saved and gives their life to Jesus, they can't come tomorrow to church but they need to come tomorrow to my home, to your home where they need to belong and they need to be connected to other believers. Because Vlad and Ilya and others, we cannot be connected to every believers but you and I, we can be connected to each other. And then after that, these babies, they go to school and they learn English, they learn math and they learn other stupid stuff that they shouldn't learn. But they go and they learn stuff. And then after that, we kick them out of our houses. Well, we hope for them to leave our houses. Now, imagine you're a loving parent. It is the loving thing for your little cutie pie baby who you raised, nursed and loved. You walk, you walk that baby down the aisle and then you let that baby go into starting their own family. How many of you know this process is not supernatural? Normal. Somebody say normal. This is not weird. This is not deeper life. Non-Christians do this. Christians do this. Poor people do this. It is when you reach a particular age, you're expected to move out of your mama's house, your daddy's house. Now, I can tell you one thing. Growing up is hard. When I was a kid, I wanted to drive a car. I wanted to have my own car. I wanted to be an adult. I would take my dad's pants and put them on. I would take my dad's shoes and put them on and say, I, wanna, I cannot wait to grow up to be an adult. I was never told the lie. That being an adult is hard. I look back now, I miss the good old days. I miss the time when my mom would cook for me. I miss the times when my laundry would be done and I don't know, angels did it or God did it or my mom did it. Somebody did it. It was always done. I miss the times I didn't have to worry about taxes, real estate taxes, house payment. I miss the time when I didn't have to pay for my car, for my gas. I miss the time. And so, but it will be abnormal to just because I love the comfort of being cared for my parents to be a 36-year-old living with my mom 
and having my wife. I had to move out of my parents' house and start my own life. It's normal. This is a normal process. Same thing is spiritually, guys. God wants us to be saved. God wants us to be discipled. And this is not, oh, but Vlad, I don't have time for that. Oh, but that's not for me. S excuse me? No, the question is this, is growth for you? No, but I don't want to grow up. That's not healthy. If I would come up today, 36 years old with diapers, what would you think of me? No, you would number one say, what happened to his parents? Is he all right? Because that's not healthy. Actually, that's sick. Now, I'm about to say for your first time, close your ears right now. And you're not a Christian. Close your ears for just a second. But guys, it's not normal to be 20 years in church and not win souls, not make disciples. But this is why we do it. Because we love mama doing laundry, daddy paying bills and doing nothing. And God's message for us today is grow up. It's normal. It's part of spiritual growth to grow up. It's just part of maturity to grow up. Amen. Number four, winning souls and making disciples is being faithful to what we were given. Jesus says to those who received five talents, they went and traded them and made another five talents. Matthew 25 verse 16. And those who traded those talents, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Number five is that we are given the power of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of conquering the world. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in all Samaria. I want you to notice that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, this is not about tongues. You understand that writing, spirit of interpretation, gift of interpretation, power when the Spirit comes upon you and the goal is for us to be witnesses. And the witness, this is not only to my familia, but it's to my city. And then Jesus says, in case you get really good at it and you actually get the whole city, I want you to go to the next one. And that is the region. Judea is the region. And then I want you to go to Samaria. This is already a Gentile. This is not even like your crew, your, your people, your circle of influence. And then when you're done with Samaria, he says, I want you to notice your limit. Your limit is the end of the earth. When I grew up in a more of a Pentecostal circle, the goal was tongues, the limit was tongues. And if you get the tongues and you get slain under the power, man, that's it, you're the Pentecostal. Our goal is not to make you Pentecostal. Our goal is to make you somebody who has the power and the purpose. Because I've met a lot of people who speak in tongues, but they don't walk in power. They don't heal the sick. They don't raise the dead. They don't cleanse the lepers. They don't cast out demons and they don't preach the gospel. All they do is baramazda shara barahanda. The Spirit of God did not come to give you tongues. He came to give you power because you have a purpose. And because you have a purpose, God has a plan. And God's plan is conquering the city. God's plan is to conquer the region. God's plan is to win other regions. And God's plan is to influence the world. Please understand, Jesus died for God so loved the world and he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life for God did not send his son to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved God's purpose and goal is the ends of the earth every human being's default destination is lake of fire without God and God's method to stop that from happening is letting his son die on the cross taking the sin and the guilt of all humanity and leaving his children to be the ambassadors in this generation God gave them the ministry of reconciliation. God gave them the power that they need to fulfill that ministry of reconciliation. So you don't have to blame your personality. You don't have to start using your schedule as an excuse why I'm not doing this. Well, I just grew up all my life in church. We know this, this, this. Stop that. And start believing what the Bible says. And your Christian life will have revival. And instead of just walking through the ritual and through the routine, you will have revival. I will have revival. The Spirit was not given for me to shake and bake and just experience more and more. Those are amazing things. It's kind of like this. God gives you a private jet and you treat it like a dog taking it for a walk. You don't need a jet if you're not planning to fly. You were given the power. Not so that people, I would go to summer camps all the time and there was this pressure put on every teenager to get tongues. And it's like, look, if you don't have tongues, you're not worthy. You're, not, you're like not worthy in Pentecostal circles. 
and we missed the whole point. The point wasn't tongues. Tongues is important. It's a prayer language. Very important. We're learning this in our uh, small groups right now. But the goal is power. Because when you taste this, when you pray for a person and the demon comes out of them, when you pray for the person and that tumor leaves, when you pray for the person and eczema is gone, when you pray for the dead people and they get raised, my friend, that's so much better than just ministering on Sunday morning and just directing traffic or just simply sitting people down or just greeting people. Those things are good. But this stuff, this is what you and I were promised. This is what you and I have. This is for this, for this, for this, and for this, and for this, and for this, and for that. Guys, we're here to change the world through the preaching of the gospel. We're here to conquer the world through the preaching of Jesus and we got all we need in us and that is the power of the Holy Ghost. So my goal today is open your eyes, look a little bit higher. I know we're going to the convention center but what God wants to do to your center is not big enough. But what God wants to do through you and through me, yeah, maybe you and I are not going to have our YouTube channels. Maybe we're not going to write books or stand here on the pulpit. But it does not mean the same Spirit, not Spirit Junior, not Spirit Version 2, but the same Spirit lives inside of you and inside of me. But God didn't give that Spirit only as a seal of our inheritance, but as a power to do what He called us to do. So I want to encourage you today. I want to plant the seed in just a few months from now. We are going to bring few things out for our church that I would like us to take part in that will be mainly strategically focused on turning believers into disciples and disciples into disciple makers. Why am I burning for this? This is not a new program. This is not a new system and I won't tell you what we're going to do for now. Just going to tell you why we're doing it. This is why. If Ilya dies and Mariana, somebody will continue their legacy. They got girls. If I and Lana die, we don't have kids. I have a dog. My dog is not going to continue my legacy. God does not want the ministry of what we do today to end with us. He wants next generation to take it. But it's not going to happen accidentally. It's going to happen intentionally. Children are not going to become responsible adults if nobody trains them. You don't put a child in a, in a freezer for 30 years and it comes out an adult. No, you train them. You put in some time. And those of you who raise children, you know one thing, it's extremely time consuming. To make a baby is pretty fun. To raise the baby is pretty hard. And so discipleship, that's not easy. It's, it's, it's not fun. I'm going to tell you that right away. And I know each one of you, if you have not disconnected from what I'm saying, you probably are saying, I don't have time for that. You don't understand how busy I am. You don't understand what I have in my life. I don't need another thing to be committed. Just be happy that I came to church. I gave my tithe and I'm out. And that's fine if that is where you are at today spiritually. I'm hoping that you're just a new believer. But if you've been for 20 years in the church and you have that status, I want to tell you something that you're just a, a very irresponsible, immature, spiritual person. Maybe you're not aware that you need to grow. That's why we're here to expose you to that. That you continue to be thinking. Just be thinking. I'm not saying do anything. Just think about the possibility that, hey, there has to be more. I'm pretty sure you go home from Monday to Friday saying, hey, there's more to Christian life. My life is no much different than anybody else. Just live, eat, sleep and repeat. Live, eat, sleep, work and repeat. There's more to that. There's way more. And my goal is to expose us that we are not just having a huge audience where thousands of people come in but people live superficial, shallow, powerless, empty, dry lives. But when we do gather on Sunday, it's like gathering of an army because we all have been slaying. We all have been praying. We all have been doing things during the week and we come back and we say, man, God did this. Like I was in the lobby, a few people came and was like, hey, I got this person delivered. I got this person brought to the Lord. Look what God has done. You know, look what we did in Chawana High School. Look what we did in, in Pasco High School. This is what it's all about. It's us living our Christian life outside of the church and not just being good citizens, husbands and wives, but being a good influence with the purpose to win souls. I'm looking at what's happening with the youth right now. I'm looking at what's happening in the schools. This is a perfect opportunity for us to have a generation after us who will do greater things we even imagined. But for that to happen, we have to be intentional and discipling. Intentional about discipleship. So I want us to be praying for that. In fact, as you said it there right now, all I'm asking is that you open your heart to this and that you read the Gospels and see if it's true. If you don't see this in the Gospels, everything I said, scratch it, throw it away. 
But if you see it in the Gospels and you see it in Jesus, I want you to submit yourself to this Word, to the Word in the Scriptures and say, Lord, what does this look like for me? And then submit yourself to the vision of the church, to the pastors as they try to fulfill the vision of Jesus and let's go and change the world. Place your hand up on your heart. Dear Jesus, you've given us salvation, you've given us your life, but you've given us more than your life. You've given us your purpose. You've given us your Holy Spirit. Lord, you've called the church to conquer the world. Lord, you've called us to walk in signs and wonders. You've called us to walk in miracles, not only in the church service, but outside of the church service. You've called us to be the light and the salt to our generation. Not to conquer people through politics or through financial means, but to conquer people through love, to conquer people through the preaching of the gospel, Lord. Lord, we have children, we hear them right now all around this sanctuary, running around, yelling and screaming, and they might not fully understand what is happening, but Lord, very soon, they will be your candidates, your ambassadors. We pray for the sake of next generation. We pray, Lord, for the sake of people that are not even here yet, who are supposed to be here through the preaching of ours, God. Lord, my heart breaks. Though I see what you're doing at Hungry Jan, but I see the, the world that is going to hell in a handbasket and my heart breaks because I know that each and every one of us have this ministry. Lord, would you help us to lead the church slowly, wisely, and with passion. Lord, that we will not live cold-hearted. That we will not live with our lamps burnt out, no light, no fire. That we will not live superficial, empty, compromised, carnal. Just, just this inflated lives that are not real, that are not genuine. There's no revival there, God. I don't want that. I know every person here who serves you don't want that either. We want to grow. We want to mature. We want to take on more responsibility. We want to take on more tasks that you have for us as our King. We want to love you not with our lips, but with our lives. We want to follow you not only on Instagram and on Twitter, but we want to follow you in real life. We want to lay our life down so that we can love you and love our families, so we can lead our families to Jesus. Lord, we refuse to let TikTok and CNN disciple next generation. We will disciple next generation. We will teach them the truth of your word, God. We will, if we need to, separate another night so that we can bring our children, bring our spouses, bring our, bring our families so we can all be trained to do your work so that we can conquer the world for you, Lord. We only have one life. We want to spend it, waste it completely on your cause. We don't want the devil to wreck it. We want to give it to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.